So welcome back to the four survival snippets by the cabal of likely suspects who we promise we are completely harmless and we did not uh, start this apocalypse. Uh, in this segment, we want to talk about uh, lessons purpose. from the Rona. And uh, one of our members actually had to leave early. So we, we grabbed his segment. We're going to splice that in right here. And then we'll come back and follow up on some other comments and thoughts by the group. So, uh, Doc Father, uh, why don't you take it away? Uh, let's see, real quick, uh, lessons from uh, COVID-19. Um, I think one of the biggest ones that, uh, that we can see is mental health. Um, oh, yes. People stressed people are you wouldn't you, know, you don't necessarily think about it being stressful but um particularly with uh either being out of work uh or working from home so you have your usual home stresses but now you have your job stresses as well and um now they're both in the same place as opposed to being in separate places and uh so instead of at least having that break which is going to work or coming home from work work is now sitting in your in your living room uh with you and um you know we we're seeing an increase of uh all kinds of you know mental health stresses uh and you know that's not something that we were that we're really talking about you know everybody's talking about masks and washing the hands and, and things of that nature and that's all you know either good or useful information but how do you how do you de-stress when you're you know constantly uh, on the go in the place where you live and uh and that i think is something that really needs to be addressed um you know take some time to to de-stress yourself uh otherwise you know we're, we're seeing it. We're seeing an increase in domestic violence. We're seeing an increase in alcoholism. We're seeing an increase in suicides uh, or calls out for help to the mental, uh, mental health uh, crisis hotline. So, you know, this is one of those things that I don't think anybody was actually prepared for, and it's, it's not being handled well. And it's uh, very relevant because in an apocalypse scenario, you are going to be in your home you're going to be all your stressors are going to be where you are and it's not going to be separate workplace and dwelling place yeah and uh so you need to find out for yourself and and you know it's it's not a cookie cutter uh thing one thing isn't going to work that works for one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else so you need to find um how you deal with stress whether that's for some people, let's go out and exercise for other people. Let's get lost in a hobby or something like that, but you need to make sure that you're doing it in a manner that is um, still healthy. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you're, if your coping mechanism uh, for, for stress is to go play D and D, but now all you're doing is playing D and D and you're ignoring everything else around you. That's no longer a good coping mechanism. So, you need to find that balance with whatever it is uh, that you use uh, to help you work through your stress. In our segment on home and education, Sandra mentioned the, that one of the things we shouldn't lose track of is the fine arts. And in terms of pick up an acoustic guitar, an acoustic piano, uh, uh, an instrument, uh, if it's even if it's just a recorder, a little reed instrument of some sort, learn to do something that's recreational that can, will give you something to relax and also maybe a little bit of entertainment for you and your family as well. That really ties into what we've got here. Well, thanks a lot, Doc. Doc has to leave us, and so uh, we'll be continuing in just a moment.
And thanks for that. Now let's go back to uh, uh, some of our other panelists. What are things that we have seen in this slow motion apocalypse? It is probably the most boring apocalypse that any of us who are writers could have possibly imagined. So, so there's been some really odd shortages like yeast. I mean, who yep. would actually have predicted a shortage of yeast? Well, there was no shortage of yeast. There was a shortage of containers to package the yeast that was necessary before it could be sent to the supermarkets. So one of the other things we're having trouble with is a shortage of aluminum for cans and the, um, the uh, milk you saw a while ago when they were pouring out milk. It was a lack of appropriate containers for the grocery store. So, so one of the things that kind of surprised me is not that there were no soups on the shelves. Like, I, that didn't surprise me. What surprised me is the fact that there was some soup on the shelf and it was universally New England clam chowder. <laughs> <laughs> like everything else, split pea, gone. Tomato, gone. New England clam chowder. There you go. There's a case. I mean, let's right let's face it. All those other soups you can use as a base for something. I just thought it was a weird one. Who'd have thunk? Who'd have thunk? Well, going back to the bread thing, it was funny because it, the yeast didn't run out until the bread ran out. And then everybody realized that, oh, shit, we need bread. And because apparently everybody thought a hurricane was coming. So they brought bread, <laughs> milk, and eggs, at least in this area. And, or, and then all of a sudden, or an inch of snow, an inch of snow here in the of snow. southeast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Don't all judge the bread us. was gone, and, and so then everybody turned into amateur baker hour, and so they bought all the yeast because apparently they figured they needed you know five pounds of yeast to make a loaf of bread. Yep. Millions of yeast organisms died for their sins. Okay, one yeah. of the other things that's kind of surprising and shouldn't be is um, soda has been completely available. Right? Yeah. Like you can go to the store and you can buy pretty much any soda you want unless it's Fresca. Like kind of, it just surprised me that some of the little brands are not that's brands, the thing. but the As flavors. As a manufacturing side, I can tell you exactly what was going on. Oh, I know. I know what yeah. happened. It just was one of those that unexpected. Who knew that you needed to really stock up on your peach Fresca because it's probably not going to be available for another 18 months. Well, those what are the ones I, I had to raid two different grocery stores and, and buy them completely out of the mango monster locos for my husband the, the, those cases are currently in the basement being being rationed out guarded by the dog so that brings up an interesting topic though what are the secondary and tertiary effects of you know what we saw what it so if something is going to go down and we have a little bit of time to prep for it while everybody else is grabbing toilet paper, soup, and bread that we probably already have, what should we look at in terms of what's going to be next, third, fourth rank down the line that people are going to start fighting over? Feminine products? Yes. Yeah, feminine products. There are some alternatives. Oh, I that thought you said M&M &M products, and I was like, yes, peanut and pretzel all the way. But no, <laughs> feminine products, no, yeah, but like, 100%. Um, there the are, stuff we there don't are use, options. Chris. There are menstrual cups that are reusable, and so they're a little bit more sustainable than some of the other choices out there. But for many, that's for whatever reason, it's not an option. So feminine products are a thing to look for. Um, one of the things that didn't surprise me, but I think that diapers and baby formula, if you are in that zone, it's not a bad thing to keep an extra few weeks on hand like instead of buying one can if you're able to buy two cans of the formula um, and start looking at how if you can't get your hands on baby formula what are some of your alternatives and can you make that happen for for the short run you know um, might not be a bad are, thing to have on hand for trade goods either maybe just a yeah. couple packs of diapers and you know a couple cans of formula depending on how long it lasts yeah. Um, um, sometimes if you've still got electricity, you can toss a can of, of the dry powder formula into the freezer and that'll help it last longer. One of the things I saw in my area was suddenly everybody became an amateur farmer and had a garden. Oh yeah. Now, 
there that was being a, there said, was a conversation the conversation about seed shortages. The people yeah. in my area actually are amateur farmers, and there weren't many going to waste. But I saw a lot of people in suddenly um, in the city I live near suddenly were coming out to buy seeds, and a lot of us were looking at them going, "Where are you planning on putting this in your apartment?" And you'd be amazed how many people have no idea what growing seasons are. Um, so I would say too. stock up on your seeds, but know that they're only good for about one season. They're good for, even if they're dried, they're about a year. You can so, get. One, one thing I found funny about the whole Corona thing was that, that when they started banning the gardening supplies and stuff like that at Lowe's, it's like, but the produce section is still open. <laughs> hey, oh, by the way, two for one deal. If you buy the tomato, you can take the seeds out. Yeah, but processing mm -hmm. tomato seeds can be a bit more. Um, well, not only that, but if it's example. a hybrid, which most of what we get, a lot of what we get is, your success rate is much lower than if you use an heirloom. Yep. So, um, Fair, but. one of the other things tying into what Jeremy said was um, around here, all of a sudden, all the farm supply stores were having a run on chickens and yes. other small birds quail, peahen, um, and the, uh, the local- We're talking live, we're talking live? Yeah. Yes, yes. live chicks, live chicks. Um, and, and one of the stores actually had to limit people on the number of chicks they could buy. Um, and a couple months later on now, um, we're starting to see an uptick in salmonella cases from people who were raising chicks and maybe don't have a lot of experience with it they're handling their chickens too much and they're not washing their hands or they're not handling them appropriately and they're making themselves sick um from the chicken poop okay. um one of the things we found here leading into that is i have some friends uh not me personally but some other friends who've discovered that this has been a windfall for their starting they've started a usda uh processing plant and this has been a windfall because they raise their own chickens, they raise their own meat, and suddenly they can buy chickens dirt cheap because everybody went out about four months ago, like Kathy was saying, bought these chickens, bought these calves, bought these pigs, because they thought they'd keep them on their property, and then discovered just how much work animal husbandry is. And or they now discovered they that they have no idea how to butcher. That too. Um, that actually they, means... they have picked up probably about two to three dozen chickens, dirt cheap, from people who just have no idea how to, what to do with them. So that like actually this. brings up something I was gonna ask Sandra about, because Jeremy mentioned windfalls. We'll come back to you in a minute, Kathy, but Jeremy mentioned windfalls, and Sandra, you shop a lot uh, at co-ops and markets and the like. Uh, you mentioned in one of our earlier segments about how um, you were talking with suppliers who, we're not supplying their restaurants and now they had surplus. So what are some of the surpluses and, and what are some of the unexpected windfalls that you may have seen along the way? Um, I'm really seeing them with the vegetable providers. Um, you didn't have restaurants that were making salads. So there are a lot of tomatoes. There was a lot of lettuce handy. Um, some of the dried fruit, uh, some of the fruit, because um, stop and think about what a lot of the restaurants are doing. They're do um, even some of the uh, hamburger places were selling extra stuff. They were selling extra toilet paper because they had contracts, but they didn't have anybody coming into their stores. And so, if you couldn't find toilet paper at the grocery store, you could get it from the movie theater or um, sometimes from uh, the, the local ice houses uh, or convenience stores that we call them here. Uh, but a lot of that fresh stuff that you saw with the restaurants, they still had to honor some of the contracts. And so they, they were selling uh, chopped lettuce and, and tomatoes and things like that. Because even though a restaurant might have partially reopened in a lot of locations, they were not allowed to have their salad bars open. Well, yeah, and in some cases, our smaller restaurants, um, I noticed they did not 
get into the drive through curbside type of business right away. Um, and yet they were still having to honor contracts. And so what they were doing, they hadn't opened up for curbside uh, dining yet, but even when they did, uh, some of them were behind the ball and, and getting ready for this. And so they're not, ha they weren't having the customers come back that they were used to. I'm thinking in particular of a tiny little restaurant that we have locally owned and locally chefed. Um, and he didn't open up for like six weeks. So in the meantime, his customers started going to other uh, curbside restaurants. One of the things going on that we found here is especially there's been, an, you know, while there's always been the barter economy, especially in these, especially in these rural areas, the internet has made it so much easier. And suddenly there's been an explosion on, and a lot of it wasn't where you traditionally think of online, like, you know, Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. It was people going just on their wall of posting on their Facebook, hey, I've got, or to their local you know, development or whatnot. Hey, I've got all this extra, or I just got a lot of this. You can go here and get this. And there's a lot, the barter economy took off because, in part because people were panicking and in part because a lot of this stuff, especially in the places where people, the government started banning, I can't buy this. Well, okay, we're not buying it, but I've got something you need. You've got something I need. Can I just say, though, that that's kind of been a pleasant surprise. Whenever I've been on the apocalypse track or when we hear people talk about, oh, if, if the world fell apart or it wouldn't take that much for society to completely collapse, it's been really a pleasure and a pleasant surprise to see how um, flexible we are as a society. I mean, almost overnight, we've had cottage industries popping up producing masks. We've had auto industry leaders producing respirators. We've had local butchers um, having sales to the community so that they could purchase the, the herds and the stock from local producers and provide it to the community so that they didn't have to kill off their entire herds. It, it's just been kind of really nice to see how flexible we are as, a, as uh, just a, a society that we can, we're, we're way more nimble than I think that we've given ourselves credit for. I was a local university printing headbands for face shields for the local hospitals out of titanium because that's what's in the 3D printers. This is yep. titanium that you're buying at about three to four hundred dollars for ten for about twenty pounds. Chris, how about your friend uh, with the distillery? Talk about flexible. Um, he got his building permit right around the time that uh, all the mandates led the COVID thing hit, and he immediately and, and was able to switch over and get his hand sanitizer permit. He doesn't even have a, a functional distillery at this point for his own product, but he has figured out ways to uh, not just capitalize, but also help the community in the Houston area with uh, uh, making hand sanitizer out of, out of moonshine. So he brings it in, he you know, treats it, processes it, bottles it, and puts it out for sale and donation. Um, it, it's a lesson in... Flexibility. Know, to, it, it, Not only that, but people are so much marketing. better. We're so much better than we give our... Like, we hear all of the negative. Negative, negative, negative. Riots, riots, riots. But really, on a personal level, we're so much better better as a society than we give ourselves credit for because there were so many companies that quit manufacturing whatever they were manufacturing and turned around and instantly within a few days were making products for hospitals and making products and then I know that here we had a lot of um, distributors that were like hey we're just we're writing this food off as a loss because like, this is just how it's going to be. So this food will be available to the food bank. You don't even have to get out of your car. If you cannot find access, if you don't have access to food, come and get baskets of food, bags of food here at this central location. I mean, it really has been a testament of how good people really are 
And if you look for it, you're going to find it. People are good. I saw a local church that would have a free meal for the, mm -hmm. for the community. You drive up, they hand you sandwiches and you drive on. And, and that was a great thing. Kathy, so, you looked like you were about to say something. Yes. I was. <laughs> um, I'm in Southwest Minnesota and the major employers around here and the major agricultural product around here is hogs. Um, the local production plant, um, in a day, they'll process an absurdly high number of animals. I mean, 50, 27,000 animals in a day, that, that's the number of hogs they'll go through. So when they had to shut down for two weeks, because when COVID went through the plant, all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of farmers around here that had a lot of hogs that they had to get rid of. Um, some they could ship to plants that were still running because there's about three or four other plants within reasonable driving distance. Um, other times, I mean, there were, there were farmers that were putting adverts out on Facebook that said, hey, I've got a three to 400 market weight hog and I've got a thousand of them. This is, we will charge you something like a buck a pound for this animal plus a $100 processing fee and that'll go into your freezer. Mm -hmm. Other farms were saying, look, we're not even going to do that. We're going to take a bolt gun to the hog and then it's yours and it's going to be a hundred bucks right there. So now you have people that had hogs but may or may not know how to butcher them. So the extension agency for the state of Minnesota came up with a whole bunch of YouTube videos that step by step went through how to drain and butcher your hog. That's amazing. And yes. That is really amazing. And thank heavens, the local landfill actually did not need as much space as they had planned for, for all of the animals. Now that doesn't take into account the number of farmers that killed and disposed of the animals on their farm, but there were enough alternate means of selling these animals available that it looks like a number of the local producers got through those rough few weeks. And that around here, I mean, that's huge. Farming is our main, um, the main driver of our economy. Agricultural production is the main driver of our economy. If we don't have it, you're suddenly getting into a lot more rural poverty. And, you know, that drives on further problems. Mm -hmm. Well, I think those are great positive notes to end. Um, it looks like Brent wanted to jump in here, Evil Penguin. Go ahead, do that, and then we'll wind this one up. One thing I did want to uh, mention is that we're seeing a lot of difficulties with transportation. There might be the item, but getting it from one place to another. Um, when we have, especially with what we're facing now with the coronavirus and the ambiguity of when some of these restrictions and problems are going to end, is to consider what things you might need in the future that might have long lead times. Uh, one of the things, or that might be time critical, eventually. So eventually a lot of people are going to need a good winter coat, especially for their kids. It might be fortuitous to consider looking at that stuff earlier and trying to order earlier I'm a very big guy. I can't just run into any store. So one of the things I did this summer was look at what do I have for this winter? What do I need for this winter? And order things ahead of time so that they'll come eventually, but it will be eventually before it's freezing. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. All right. So we've got some great lessons that we have learned about how we as a society uh, might handle an apocalypse uh, should it occur in our slow motion coronavirus apocalypse. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for tuning in to our four survival snippets for the 2020 virtual Dragon Con Apocalypse Rising track. And thank you. We'll be back with more.